You're listening to Prevailing Word Ministries on the Prevailing Word Podcast channel. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening. Today's message is, Who is this? Let's get right into today's message. Praise the name of the Lord. We're going to pray and get right into the word of the living God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished or equipped unto every good work. We thank you, Lord, that the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We thank you, Lord, that the entrance of your word gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. We thank you, Lord, that every word of God is pure and you are a shield to those who put their trust in you. And we also thank you that you desire truth in the inner part and in the hidden part. You will make us to know wisdom. And therefore, we thank you once again, Father, that your word tells us that we are to ask for wisdom, uh, that when we pray, we ask for wisdom and we receive it by faith. For you told us in your word that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. We thank you for this in Jesus name. Amen. We want to thank you for joining us here on our Palm Sunday service. And we're going to uh, get right into the word of the living God. If you would open up your Bibles to the uh, book of uh, Matthew chapter 21, and the title of this message is, Who is this? So here in the uh, book of Matthew chapter 21, we're going to begin at verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a cult, a, a, a cult, the foal of a donkey. So his disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the cult, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Some of you will recall that when the birth of Jesus took place, that uh, the uh, leaders of the Roman government decided to have a census, if you will, and forced all the Jews to go into a particular city. But they didn't realize what they were doing. What they were doing was that they were forcing a scripture to be fulfilled. Because uh, as a result of this, Joseph took Mary and the baby Jesus into Nazareth. Now, Jesus wasn't born just yet, but nonetheless, the city of Nazareth serves as a, a reminder of what took place in the Old Testament. And if you study out the Old Testament very well, as far as Nazareth is concerned, it was a city where uh, people would come and consecrate and dedicate themselves unto the Lord. And uh, you know the story about Samson. Samson, he was a Nazarite and he didn't allow a razor to cut his hair. And so it was a city of uh, a city known for consecration. But uh, j since then, it has perverted itself and it's no longer considered a place a of consecration. You recall in the book of John where 
uh, uh, one of the disciples that Jesus was about to choose uh, said this and, and said this about Jesus because uh, they found the Lord Jesus and said, hey, come and see uh, this. Uh, this is the Messiah. And then the, the statement was made, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth? And, and, and so uh, that story says a, a lot about the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel. But Jesus came out of Nazareth. And so there is something that uh, we have to understand that not all cities have all wickedness in it. Somewhere in the city, there may be somebody that is walking in the word of the living God as far as the gospel of, of God is concerned. But uh, we're going to read further down because there's some things that we can connect to to this story about Jesus uh, triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem that pays significance. And we're going to see some things that will be brought to light that perhaps we've never considered or studied out. Now, if you have studied it out, then this is serving as a reminder of what all of these events were about. Here in the book of Matthew, here we're in tw the 21st chapter. Look at verse 12, starting there. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. In other words, they were very upset that Jesus was being worshipped for who he is. And that is the son of man or the son of God. You will notice that I pulled up the definition of indignant and, and uh, it means to be greatly afflicted or displeased or moved with indignation. Uh, and he said to them, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, I have have. Yes. Have you never read out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there here in verse 18. Now, now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry and seeing a fig tree on the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. There is some connection to this, which we'll see in a moment, but we're going to go back up into uh, the top of the verse. And uh, because there's some references here that we need to uh, identify and uh, pretty much connect. Now, notice that Jesus was in Beth Bethpage. This definition of Bethpage bears serious significance. So we shouldn't, uh, you know, set aside things that we read and just simply go to the meat of the text. But we need to slow down a little bit and, and, and go through the text in a, as great a detail as possible. But notice that I pulled up the definition of a Bethpage and it means fig house. A, a, a place in Palestine, and there's no such thing as Palestine. This is Israel. They should have said Israel. So anytime that you see a reference to Palestine, they're incorrect because the land is called Israel and not Palestine. But see, notice the definition of uh, Bethpage, of Bethpeg, and it means house of unripe figs. So now we're beginning to see the story that Jesus uh, uh, shared with the, the, the disciples, not so much a story, but a statement about uh, the fig tree being withered. There's some connection here. So he was there at Bethpeg, house of unripe figs. Very powerful uh, to, to reference this because now we're going to read other stories 
in the uh, Gospels, the four Gospels, concerning uh, this triumphal entry of Jesus, which is a good uh, subtopic, if you will. Here in the book of uh, Mark chapter 11 and verse 1, now again, we have to understand that whenever we're reading the synoptic Gospels, it is a summary of the Gospels. Some stories will differ from another because the, the Holy Spirit wants us to get a full picture of what took place in the city. So a lot of people say, well, there's discrepancies there. Well, have you ever sat down and, and ran a story through 10 people? And by the time you get to the 10th person, the, the story is kind of changed a little bit uh, or, or added to or subtracted from. And, and so this, the gospel serve that kind of way that so that way we can get a full picture, not that the story from an individual end up in that it would be the same. But you get my point. Now, here in the book of Mark, chapter 11 and verse one. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage, uh, the uh, and Bethany, and that's another city in the area of the Mount of Olives. Now, let me uh, clue you in on the Mount of Olives. If you if you ever know anything about the Mount of Olives, Jesus will return uh, to the Mount of Olives, and this you can find in the uh, book of Zechariah, which we'll get to in momentarily because we need we need we need to see the uh, the 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 source for which this prophecy was fulfilled. Uh, 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 so Bethany serves as a, a very important thing. But in terms of the Mount of Olives, the Lord Jesus will return to the Mount of Olives and he will establish his kingdom for a thousand years on the earth. And then the end will fully come when Satan is cast into the lake of fire. But that's another subject. All right. So the Mount of Olives is the place where Jesus will come back. And that's his second coming and not the rapture. Those are two different uh, subjects. The rapture, the rapture is different from the second coming of Christ, but the Lord Jesus nonetheless will return to the Mount of Olives. Interesting to note also that in the book of Mark chapter 13 and also in the books of uh, Matthew uh, chapter 24 and 25, those books, those chapters work uh, together. And also the book of Luke chapter 17 and chapter 21 uh, Jesus was on the Mount of Olives and giving his discourse about what will take place as far as the end times is concerned. So it's interesting that the Lord is uh, giving uh, this uh, story to us in terms of the Mount of Olives. So it has significance here. So here in the uh, the book of, uh, of Mark chapter 11, notice the term Bethany. Here the word Bethany means house of misery house of misery now we don't know if it, now now you could say i wouldn't say we wouldn't know but you could say that what jesus is about to experience is a whole lot of misery at the hands of the jews and also of the romans but it but it also could say of the spiritual condition of the nation of israel that it was a house of misery so uh uh here we, you will see uh, that it is a village at the Mount of Olives, about two miles, three kilometers from Jerusalem on or near the normal road to Jericho. Now, this is where we get a Sabbath day's journey from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, uh, because uh, when, when you're dealing with a Sabbath, a Sabbath day's journey, people can only travel but so far to get to either their house or their home or to the temple or to the synagogue. So uh, uh, that's the distance that they were allowed to travel. But nonetheless, when we when we study out the uh, book of uh, Mark, chapter 11, as far as the story of the triumphal entry, we will see some variation. Verse two now. And he said to them, go into the village opposite you as and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has set has sat loose it and bring it. Now, here's the differentiation Here's the difference rather not differentiate the difference between Matthew's story and Mark's account. Now, remember, uh, Matthew is an eyewitness of the Lord Jesus because he was a disciple. Mark is not. He is Mark. Uh, he was he is John Mark, which uh, the Lord would use later on in the ministry of Paul uh, and, and Barnabas because he was the cousin of Barnabas. And, and so Mark, uh, John Mark here wrote the book of Mark and, and Mark, Mark is actually called Marcus. I have to find that out. Uh, uh, so, so his actual name is Marcus and that's his surname. But nonetheless, 
uh, uh, we see here that there's a difference of the story that there was a cult and and then and, and there was a, a a donkey and then it's cult. But here we see just a cult, and that's what you're going to see in the book of Luke and also in the book of John. So there's a difference in the story. So, but nonetheless, that's that's not a disqualifying a discrepancy. Uh, look here at and in verse three now. And if anyone says to you, "Why are you doing this?" say, "The Lord has need of it." Again, back in verse two, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has set. Loose it and bring it and bring it. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street. And they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go. When uh, then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it and he sat on it and many spread their clothes on the road and others cut down leafy branches from trees and spread them on the road. So uh, three things happen. First, they put the clothes on the colt uh, and uh, and on the foal, uh, the, the colt or the donkey and, and sat Jesus on them. And then we see that they spread their clothes out on the road and they cut down branches, which were palm trees, if you will, and spread them on the road or, or they waved them uh, either way. Nonetheless, it is part of the story. And that's where we get the story of Palm Sunday from. And now verse nine says, then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father, David, that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And then Jesus went in the temple uh, uh, and Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around all at all these things, uh, looked around at all things, rather, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And then we see here in verse 12, now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. He went out to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, it, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? but you have made it a den of thieves. In other words, buying and selling has everything to do with money. In other words, they perverted the temple, much like what we're seeing today in some of the houses of worship. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. And then we see the lesson here. Now in the morning, verse 20 now, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God, for verily, for surely, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So let's go back into uh, 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 Luke uh, chapter 19 and we will see a story of a similar fashion when he had said this he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage that, and Bethany at the mount called Olivet 
that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where as you enter, you will find a cult tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. Uh, I'm going to try to move this over so you can see if the, th those of you that are, that are reading along along with me, uh, because uh, I want you to see the uh, the verses of scripture that we're using. All right. Uh, uh, so verse 30 again, go into the village opposite you as you enter, you will find a cult tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to them, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as he but as they were loosing the cult, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the cult? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they bought uh, they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the cult and they set Jesus on him and he went away. And as he went, many spread the clothes on the road. Then as uh, then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitudes of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. But here we see a little story that uh, is very powerful that has connections to Bethany, house of misery. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known even you, especially in this hour, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. And this, of course, is referencing to the 21st chapter of the book of Luke. Verse 44, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, this, of course, is in connection also with A.D. 70. Remember that the temple was destroyed in A.D. 70, and in A.D. 70, Titus came and destroyed the temple and through the stones of the entire temple over the side. You could see a, a, a picture of this uh, if you were to uh, Google it or or whatever search engine that that you use. And you will see on the southwestern side of the Temple Mount at the bottom of the hill or the bottom of the wall, if you will, is the stones that were thrown as a as a sign that the that the prophet, the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, also known as the son of man, his word was true. So it became a house of misery. Then in verse 45, we see, then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. But you have made it a den of thieves. That's verse 46, the bottom portion. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and scribes and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were, and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive, very attentive to hear him. So now we're going to see another story in the book of uh, John now, John chapter uh, 12. And uh, also something that we have to understand. Let's read the passage first and then uh, we'll, we'll get right into uh, 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 a little expounding on the, the uh, scriptures here. L notice in verse 12, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, meaning that he was raised from the dead, then they remembered that these things were written about him and they had and, and, and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see, that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, something about Bethany also, but it was the hometown of Lazarus where Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, there are pictures in Wikipedia and other places where you will find that the tomb of Lazarus is still a tourist attraction. The place where Lazarus was called out by the Lord to be raised from the dead. But notice that all of these stories, they, they appear uh, a, a similar in fashion, but there are differences of of uh, renditions, which gives us a fuller picture, in, in my opinion, not so much as a contradiction, but no, but more so a full picture of what took place at the at the triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's a whole lot of background that we can uh, get into as far as the triumphant entry of the Lord, which which in, in a way is not too much. Uh, of of an of an offshoot, but whenever a king is coming through a town, they it they it is like a triumphant entry. For instance, if you were to go into the Old Testament and see the story about Absalom, Absalom when he was attempting to take over the kingdom uh, and and not allow, and not allow Solomon to rise as king, uh, he would put he would ride in a chariot and put runners before him, and and that is a signal to the whole world that this individual is a great individual and that you ought to follow this individual. They are now king and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of triumphant entry that uh, Absalom tried to make, but it it failed because he was later on killed as a result Solomon was the one that was to be the king the second king excuse me the third king of Israel because you had Saul you had David and then you had Solomon which Solomon is the third king but nonetheless it is just a triumphant entry and when Jesus got on the the colt or, or the donkey uh, next thing you know it was a triumphant entry and the people spread their clothes on the road and 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 cut down palm branches and laid them on the road. But they also waved them before saying before the Lord Jesus saying Hosanna in the highest. Now, notice this in, in uh, Matthew chapter 21, which I became which I came back to and notice in a uh, verse four beginning there. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And this prophet is none other than the prophet Zechariah. And here in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Hence, when the people cried out Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna means save, O Lord, just as he is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So if you know anything about Bible prophecy, uh, Daniel wrote the book of uh, of Daniel, obviously, uh, around somewhere in the uh, uh, 500 B.C., the sixth century. But also Zechariah wrote his book around the same time, around 520 uh, B.C., which is roughly about four years for lunar calendar years before the children of Israel were to return to Israel after 70 years of the Babylonian captivity. Please, this this is lining up and showing us how intricate the Bible is and how detailed the Bible is as far as the the trustworthiness of the scriptures. So this was given to us almost 520 years before the birth of Christ, 
right around the time in which the children of Israel were to return into the promised land and rebuild the temple, which is the second uh, the, the second temple. And, and then Herod's temple was a refurbishing or remodeling of that temple and, and, and rebuild the wall. And, and so why do we have all these symbologies? Well, first of all, as far as the book of Zechariah is concerned, uh, we see here that this is a sign or a symbol that the children of Israel is to look for for the Messiah to return. And so all throughout the Old Testament, there are various portions of scriptures that we see that point to none, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Palm Sunday serves as a very significant day for the believers in seeing that scripture came to pass. And that's why we don't set aside the Old Testament, although in the sense that it is finished because uh, the first has to be done away with and, and, and the second must be brought forth. So the second covenant, if you will, is the New Testament. But nonetheless, we still need the Old Testament because there are saying, there are things in the Old Testament that have yet to come to pass. Now, Jesus is the end of the of the covenant because he fulfilled the covenant. But nonetheless, there are things in the Old Testament that have yet to come to pass. And we shouldn't be so quick like a uh, 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 certain individuals that's that say that we don't need the Old Testament anymore. Better be very careful. Yes, we do. We still need the Old Testament. But nonetheless, uh, this was a prophetic sign for them to look for in terms of identifying who the Messiah is. And so there's a lot of people that seriously back then did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And even to this day, there are a whole lot of Jews that do not believe, nor do they accept Jesus as the Messiah. But nonetheless, Notice what it says here in verse six. So, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them and set him on on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. So let's pull up the definition of Hosanna. And you see the word Hosanna, and it is of Hebrew origin, excuse me, and it means, O oh, save, uh, Hosanna, that is Hosanna, an exclamation of adoration. And so that's why when you see, but, oh, that's a good, that's a good uh, expounding, be propitious. Uh, uh, so, so that's where we get the propitiation from that we see in the book of Romans. Also in the book of Hebrews and in first John chapter two, that he is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but the sin of the whole world. And, and, and so uh, 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 we want the Lord to come and to save and the Messiah came for that particular reason. And so this should have been a serious sign to anyone that knows anything about the scriptures. And they should have ran a reference back to the prophets to see what was said. But some of these people failed to do so, including the standard. Sanhedrin, or they might have known that the scriptures was pointing to the Messiah, but they would have nothing to do with it. Verse 10 now. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? Well, all you have to do is go back to the book of Zechariah, and you can find out who is this. And it was none other than the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming through the city on a donkey in terms of his triumphant entry. But it wouldn't last long because a few days from this particular day of, of Palm Sunday, the Lord Jesus Christ would be crucified on Good Friday. He would be crucified and put to death as a result of uh, the jealousy of the Jews because the whole world was going after the Lord Jesus. But nonetheless, on the first day of the week, he would be raised from the dead. So the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. All they have to do is go back into the Old Testament and find these scriptures about Jesus coming out of Nazareth, Nazareth of Jesus coming out of uh, coming through uh, Bethany and Beth Peg, Beth Page, and and, and and all they had to do was put it all together. And next thing you know, they'll begin to put a better picture on the fact that this is the actual Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ that would come and save his people from their sins. 
And that's why each and every year we go back over and over again and discuss the uh, these stories because uh, people sometimes put distance from these stories and don't realize the spiritual significance of these stories that all of these things point to one person and to one person only the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one that was to come. And, and now he's in heaven now because he was raised from the dead and taken up into heaven, but he will return one day to the Mount of Olives. And that is the second coming of Christ. And the children of Israel will see who they have pierced. And, 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 and that's why the book of Zechariah, if we, we studied out the book of Zechariah chapter 9 to some degree, but we also studied out the book of Zechariah chapters 12, uh, uh, 13, and 14 because they have end time significance. 500 years from the birth of Christ, they had end time significance that if anybody were paying attention, this has significance to us even today. And so we should celebrate Palm Sunday from the, from the standpoint of two things. Number one is leading to the fact that Jesus is the triumphant King of Kings and Lord of Lords and that there is nobody like him. And second of all, that a few days from that Palm Sunday, uh, almost 2000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ would die on the cross for our sins, paying the penalty for sin for every man, woman, boy and girl. And that on the first day of the week, on the third day that he would be raised from the dead. So it plays serious significance. And so it's very important that we go back over these stories again and again. Now, if you were to study out the book of uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, you will see the seven uh, feasts that the children of Israel were to keep. And the first four feasts were fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, the uh, uh, the feast of unleavened bread, the the what the Passover was fulfilled, and also the 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 feast of uh, first fruits, and also the feast of weeks. These things were fulfilled in its place as far as far as the Old Testament is concerned. And, and the Lord had these feasts celebrated for a reason. They want the Lord wanted them to remember where they came from as far as their deliverance is concerned. So when we go over the story, the stories about Passover and whatnot, it is of great significance and it does no harm to go back over the stories to see exactly uh, what took place in the time that Jesus walked the earth, because it is leading up to the final countdown. As a side note, uh, it is rumored. I don't know if it's rumored, but it's more so uh, uh, a serious significance that the Levitical priesthood may, they may sacrifice the heifer, the red heifer that was brought to Israel uh, uh, from, from, uh, from Texas. And, and so far there hasn't been any blemishes found on these heifers. And so if they sacrifice this red heifer, it, it plays a significant role. The sacrificing of the red heifer is from the book of Numbers chapter 19. And you should take time to read that because there are several things that have uh, a lot to do with the uh, sacrificing of the red heifer. And it plays a very significant role. And that's why the events that are taking place in Gaza has serious end time implications. And so uh, we need to pay attention to these events because these events are playing a very significant role in our end times in shaping up the end times that is about to take place in terms the, of the finality of Daniel's final week or 70th week of prophecy. And so each and every time we, we see these events like, like uh, the resurrection of Christ, and the Passover and so forth, they place significance to us and we need to pay attention to these things because the Lord is soon to come. And that is why we need to be ready and not get ready. These events that are happening that we read over from time to time tells us that the Lord is soon to come. Now, why is it that the, that the people of 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 uh, the Arabs in the area of uh, Jerusalem do not want this to take place because see Hamas is about to uh, uh, be completely destroyed like the children of Israel did to Amalek in first Samuel chapter 15 and 16 chapters 15 and 16. We see that they were completely annihilated. And so Hamas you're seeing a complete annihilation of Hamas. Now, if Israel is true to their word, Hamas will be no more. And so what are leading up to these events? It's leading up to the kind of events that portray 
uh, that rather not portray, but tell us that the end times is coming because the children of Israel want their temple on the Temple Mount. Currently, the Dome of the Rock is there and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is there. Some of you may recall if uh, if the, the news had put it out that the operation of Hamas, the operation was called Al-Aqsa Flood because they don't want the temple to be uh, placed on the Temple Mount. And there's a reason why the, uh, the world doesn't want the temple to be built because that will usher in the Messiah, the Messiah that is to come. And that's why all of these events that we that we read in the scripture and that we see in the scriptures, they play significant end time events. So don't be don't fall asleep. Don't bat an eye because the Lord is soon to come and that we are to keep in mind all of these things that are happening before our eyes as far as the latter days is concerned. They're portrayed that they're being portrayed or, or activated before our eyes like never before. Things are going to happen in a more significant way in terms of the timing. And next thing you know, <laughs> that the Lord is soon to come. And so that's why Palm Sunday is there. It is there for us to recognize all of these events and it helps us to understand fully the plan of salvation for the entire world that will take place at the second coming of Christ. But I will say this, that during the final week, it's not just going to be that the Messiah is going to come and establish his kingdom. We have to understand that this will also be a time of great wrath, not only upon the children of Israel, but also upon the whole world. Remember in the book of Revelations chapter through chapters of five and 19, the Lord is going to pour out his wrath upon the whole earth. And so it's not going to be a time in which everybody will be just sitting around and waiting for the Messiah to come. It will be a time of great wrath and great destruction. And, and then the Messiah will come for a second time to establish his kingdom of the 1000 year reign of Christ upon the earth. And so, again, let's let's uh, seriously consider, of course, Palm Sunday uh, and not just take it as a time where we go to the store and, and pick out a palm and make a cross out of it. Although that's nice. Nothing wrong with it. There's no harm, no foul. I'm not saying not to do that, but this biblical significance of the Palm Sunday. And let us remember that the Lord Jesus Christ came in triumphant in into Jerusalem then. And he will come triumphantly into Jerusalem based on Revelation chapter 19. Thank you so much for joining us here in our study of the scriptures. And remember that the Bible tells us that we need to be saved. The Bible says in the book of John chapter three and verse three, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse five says, unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you must be born again. Jesus said this, marvel not that I say to you that you must be born again. To be born again, you, meet, you need to repent of sin and place faith on Christ alone. Remember what Jesus said on the cross in John chapter 19 and verse 30. He said before he uttered his, before he died, it is finished, meaning that the price of sin was paid in full. He satisfied the judgment. He satisfied and appeased the righteous, just, and holy God's demand that man's sin must be paid in full. It is a satisfaction of the debt. And so our works cannot do it. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter two and verse eight and nine, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then the Bible tells us in the book of Titus chapter three and verse five, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. If you do not understand the magnitude of your sin, you will never repent. You will never turn from your sin. And that's what the word repent means. It means to turn from your sin. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter four and verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You do not have much time. We, we can all die because at the end of the day, 150,000 people will have perished from the face of the earth. The Bible says in the book of second Corinthians chapter uh, six and verse three, 
Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 says, How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, after this the judgment. So if death is true on one hand, judgment is true on the other. So you have to make a choice whether or not you're going to make it into the kingdom of God by way of the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You must do it today. You do not have much time. And so that's why we preach the gospel to you so that way you know exactly what the gospel is. And that is simply from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day according to the scriptures. Now that you know the gospel, you have no excuse. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching our broadcast. And we thank you that uh, you're able to uh, hear the word of God. You're here in the land of the living on this side and take heed to the word of God, which was preached to you today. May God richly bless you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, rule and abide upon you. You've been listening to Prevalentwood Ministries on the Prevalentwood Podcast channel. We're on Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, YouTube Music, YouTube Podcast, and Spotify. Please visit our website at prevalentwoodministries.net. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please subscribe and hit that notification bell. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening.